what has the greatest impact on student learning and achievement? Fresh out of graduate school, looking to change the world, Mitch felt like there was something he was missing. No matter how hard he tried, many of his students were still struggling. One thing was clear. In order to help his struggling students, he needed tools to use in heterogeneous classrooms, resources that would move the needle for underperforming students, but also empower those who were succeeding and everyone in between. He assumed we could amplify the impact of these resources if there was common adoption across subject areas and grade levels. He just needed content agnostic tools for use in diverse classrooms, but they were missing. It's from this place Organized Binder began. The initial challenge was finding time. Educators are hired to teach a subject or a grade level, and his job was to teach biology. He found there was rarely enough time in the school day to do that job well. Where would he ever find the time to also teach his students the skills and habits they needed to achieve academically? Then one day, it hit him. He should embed practice using these skills directly into his classroom routine. If he could figure out how to do this, his students would gain daily practice employing these skills, and he would have time to do his job. Moreover, he would create a predictable and dependable learning environment for his students. Win, win, win. What coalesced in the following two years of design and constant redesign was the initial iteration of Organized Binder. It was amazing. His students began to succeed, and they began to see themselves as capable learners. They developed agency and confidence. Ten years later, Organized Binder is an evidence-based MTSS Tier 1 universal solution that creates a structured and dependable environment with clear expectations and routines. This content agnostic platform gives students exposure to goal setting, reflective learning and metacognitive practice, time and task management, study strategies, organizational skills, and more. Organized Binder aligns directly with the universal design for learning framework and is an integral component for ensuring least restrictive environments. Mitch founded this company to widen the impact of Organized Binder beyond the walls of his classroom and school. He's honored to work with K-12 districts, networks, and schools, as well as colleges, homeschools, and individual families around the country and internationally. The positive impact has been overwhelming. Schools are increasing their scores, exceptional learners are reporting huge gains, and initiatives such as PLCs are finding needed continuity and cohesion. In addition to empowering students, Organized Binder helps educators implement best teaching practices. I am so excited for you to hear from Mitch Weathers in this conversation. For reference, this conversation was recorded September 20th, 2021. Now let's get to it. I'm Lindsay Lyons, and I love helping school communities envision bold possibilities, take brave action to make those dreams a reality, and sustain an inclusive, anti-racist culture where all students thrive. I'm a former teacher leader turned instructional coach, educational consultant, and leadership scholar. If you're a leader in the education world, whether you're a principal, superintendent, instructional coach, or a classroom teacher excited about school-wide change like I was, you are a leader. And if you enjoy nerding out about the latest educational books and podcasts, if you're committed to a lifelong journey of learning and growth and being the best version of yourself, you're going to love the Time for Teachership podcast. Let's dive in. Mitch Weathers, welcome to the Time for Teachership podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. And I want to dive right in. My first big question for you is in line with what Dr. Bettina Love talks about. She talks about freedom dreaming, and she describes it as dreams grounded in the critique of injustice. As I love this quote from her, it's pretty deep, pretty powerful, but I'd love to know, thinking about that, you know, what is the big dream that you hold for the field of education? Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, My big dream is rooted in um, my experience as a classroom teacher. Um, As a little intro, I'm I'm a high school teacher. I still am a high school teacher. This is my 20th year in the classroom. And if I had to say one big dream is that we would take the modeling of and teaching of skills, um, call them executive function or non-cognitive skills or what um, some schools that we work with call it studentness, that we would take the modeling and teaching of those skills or that suite of skills as serious as we do the content or curriculum in our grade levels or our classes, recognizing that for any and all learners, that's the, the the foundation or the bedrock for learning. And yet what has frustrated me for two decades now 
Um, if you follow, just to be blunt, if you follow the money in education, you find a lot of it in um, outside of salary and payroll and benefits, of course, but you find a lot of it wrapped up in testing and in textbooks and in technology, all of which are not bad things, um, but none of which really lay the foundation for learning. So that would be my big dream. That's a great dream. I love that idea of like taking those skills seriously and thinking about the fact that if we did that, like what, you know, dreaming up what all of those possibilities could be for school, as opposed to, you know, test prep centers or whatever they are now, like, like you described. Right. So I think that's a big shift for, for people. So people listening may think that is not how my school currently does things. We are very much a test prep institution. And so I'm wondering in terms of, you know, the mindset that is required to really prioritize those skills that you're describing, um, mm -hmm. what, what are the things that you would suggest for a teacher or a leader who's listening and thinking like, okay, yeah, that's interesting. And now how do I, how do I wrap my head around doing that? Like what's, what is that mm -hmm. mindset that they would need to have moving forward? That's a really good question. Um, and I'll, if I could add to it mindset, yes. Um, but the the real challenge to this work is that we're hired to teach that content and we're assessed and so are our students by these tests. <laughs> so it's, it's also a time issue where, uh, and it's also a budget issue. There's no, as far as I've learned, there's no executive function budget, right? Where we would, the money pri makes it a priority in education. So it's like, wow, I'd really want to do this work, but how would we ever fund that? And to, for the classroom teacher or any teacher, um, it's a time thing. You, you name the, you name any teacher listening to this who has enough time in a school year to cover everything they want to cover. We don't. Um, so, so there's other factors um, just besides mindset in terms of approaching this. Um, so the key is, is this. And this is, well, here's, here's what I would say is one of the keys. If you are lacking for time, um, but you recognize that the agency that students develop when they figure out how they learn, and so they can approach their learning with more dexterity. And too often, and certainly for my students, and I would bet anybody listening, um, for, for certain populations or certain students, um, it's as if they are passive objects in their education instead of active subjects. And the, the way I've described it often is like students are, they're there, they're present, but it's like their education is happening all around them or to them, and they don't quite understand how to jump in and participate. They can kind of be there, but it's spinning all around them. And, and these executive functions or these non-cognitive skills that research has overwhelmingly indicated what gives students that dexterity and that agency to jump in and participate um, are, are key. But the, the key here is, is the modeling of and practice with those because I don't have enough time to finish what I'm doing. And to be perfectly honest, if I looked at some of these, these skills that research has indicated uh, help students, just having another lesson on the importance of them would probably be pretty boring, um, right? So it's like, here's what metacognition is or retrieval practice or even goal setting. Students don't wanna have a lesson on the importance of goal setting. Instead, let's set goals within the context of our subject and then measure them and work with them and evaluate them and reset them throughout the school year. So they're kind of like an, a working part of our course. And so the key that this belabored point I'm making here is that if students can gain exposure to and practice with these executive functions by virtue of a classroom routine, then I don't infringe upon the time I need to teach my content. And that's, what Organized Binder does for a classroom teacher. Through the student lens, it's all about practice with these skills and habits, which lead to mindsets. 
Um, but for the for the teacher, and this is what's often kind of unknown or or missed about organized binder, is that it creates for students and or for teachers a very predictable routine. And by virtue of that routine, just by engaging in it, and I mean very simple, like how we start, how we transition, how are we organizing our materials, how do we end, like predictable learning spaces are safer and students are more likely to take the risks inherent to learning in those spaces. And if by virtue of that predictable routine, I happen to get practice with all these skills, it's a win-win. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually freeing up time to focus on my content while giving students exposure to these skills. Wow, that was a really long-winded answer to your question about what kind of mindset a teacher would need. So I hope that I didn't miss the mark there. No, not at all. I think, I think you said it perfectly. So I, I'm just envisioning like, you know, a priorities list almost in my head just to make it concrete. And so just like taking a step back at times for me as a teacher was important to be like, what is most important? What is my priority for today? And a lot of times it would be, if I were to really ask myself that question and think about it, it would be that we have practice with goal setting or we have practice with this thing. And so, yeah, how can I then mindset shift? Uh, how can I then embed it, you know, in terms of a way that gives me more time back? And I think that that is exactly how we have to look at it because we can't continue to cram things in, which is, I think, historically how we try to do it is like, let's add this entire executive functioning curriculum to my existing subjects. Like that's not possible. And it's also not practical. So it's, I love yeah. this blend and this reframe that you're sharing. It yeah. really makes sense. I've asked for in any talk I give or presentation at a conference or whatever, I always start with just a blanket question of what, what has the greatest impact on student learning and achievement? And just throw it out there and let people brainstorm. I can tell you, I've never heard in a long time, a lot of years, and I've been all over the country asking this question, somebody say, really good textbooks, which again, are not a bad thing. More technology, not a bad thing. Like it's, it all comes down to these, you know, it comes down to relationships with students, of course, because this is a human to human endeavor, but it's, it's always these content agnostic skills and habits that when I develop Again, it's that agency as a learner that's so often missing. And I made the mistake as a new teacher. I'm a science teacher and, and lucky me, right? We get to blow things up and go outside and drop watermelons off buildings. And that stuff's all fun and engaging, but it does not equate to learning all the time if these, these skills and habits are missing. And that, that's what where the, the kind of history of my work as an educator, that that's what really struck me. And when I first came into the classroom, and I I came out of a nonprofit um, background, and so I had quite a few years of experience working with young people. And when I entered the classroom, um, how to interact with young people, which it can take a few years for some some teachers to figure just that piece out. But the relationship piece, I kind of I could do. And it just became like overwhelmingly clear, like, oh, you don't, you don't know how to do this school thing. And most of them, I, I worked with a, a large um, migrant population, undocumented population, second language learners, historic academic failure, and yet gifted. And too often students, many students are viewed through a deficit lens as opposed to an asset lens, meaning our, our industry sees them, for lack of better expression, our industry sees them for what they don't bring to the classroom rather than what they do. And um, it became clear to me, like, oh, we have to uncover all of those because you'd have a lot of these executive functions already as, as well as others, but how do we uncover those, practice them, and leverage them in the classroom as assets? So. That's such a powerful point. And I think it takes me to my next question too, which is kind of what does that look like at a classroom level? So I know you have organized finder, you have all of these great approaches and practices. Do you mind walking us through like either a strategy or just kind of like a, what that might look like in a school day? 
Yeah, I'm glad. I'm really glad you asked that. I didn't know you were going to ask that. Um, I became completely obsessed when, so Organized Binder just came out of my classroom and, I, and, I, and my practice. And, and I'll, I'll answer your question in, in just a moment, like what's one specific? But one thing I can't stand about our industry is, perf- well, first of all, any professional development that's a one-time flash in the pan, we never see you again, done. We need to just ban those people and whoever's doing that. It's not worth it. That's not to say a keynote's wrong, but when we're talking about professional development and to your really important question of what's it look like tomorrow in my class, I would sit through these, you know, even really inspiring and and helpful professional learning experiences. But to make it a part of my daily practice took so much work on the backside that it eventually it just became another thing on the shelf in my office or in my classroom that I never really could get around to. And I never wanted that for Organized Binder. So I, once it kind of came about, and again, I had no intention of sharing this whatsoever, but colleagues started showing up and saying, hey, I'm working with the same kiddos and I'm not having any success. And they're all telling me about what's going on in your room and they're fired up about it. And I was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I've started designing this this system that the kids called organized binder because there actually is a physical binder to it and they actually were organized for the first time and that's where the name came from for better or worse but I wanted teachers in an audience to sit through a, a training or experience and the next day hit the ground running with almost no friction and and that's possible that's something that I'm really proud of now What's it look like? I can tell you that when I first started teaching, I had a, this is just one example. I had a really, really out of control, tardy situation. Our school did, Um, but not so much truancy, but tardy. And it, it drove me crazy. Like, come on, like kids would be standing outside my classroom. They'd be like running down the hall. They would be up and like, it was just like, I think in their mind, like if they were kind of even in the general vicinity or geography, that, that that's like good enough. And for me, it hit me one day. I was like, okay, well, I just assumed, and that's the, the A word in education, right? If, as soon as we make one assumption as a classroom teacher, like we always have to check ourselves because as soon as you start making assumptions, you could be so off the mark, right? But I just assumed everybody knew that when the bell rang, because we were a school that had bells, that meant class started. And when class starts, that means you're in your seat. I've assigned you a seat and you're at least facing forward so we can talk, you know. And I just assumed that everybody had that understanding. And then it hit me one day like, oh, I had big classes back then, really challenging students. Like it wouldn't be uncommon to have like 40 kids in my class. I'd be like, so there's my idea of what it means to be on time. And then there's 40 other versions of that. And we've never talked about it. I don't even know what you think. Cause you might think being outside the class, which is driving me crazy. And now we're having like a relational conflict and I'm having to be the authoritarian. All because we haven't communicated. It has nothing to do with like, the expectation. It's just a a lack of clarity. And so I didn't, I certainly didn't ask anyone's opinion on what it meant to be on time. I just had to make my expectations hyper explicit. So one of my favorite books is called Other People's Children by Lisa Delpit. And if I had to um, summarize her thesis in that is that uh, we need that which is implicit in the classroom, we need to make explicit. And I could no longer just assume that you knew what it meant to be on time because I hadn't made that hyper explicit. And so where organized binder really became like a, really like a spark of magic was um, I became obsessed with creating hyper predictable classroom routines that I could communicate without using words. So 
if this, again, I, I tend to get a little long-winded here, so cut me off whenever, but you asked, what does it look like? Um, I would, once it, it came about, and you, I wish everyone had an organized binder in their hands because they would see that it's this physical, tactile, yes, everybody out there, it's actual paper and a binder. Um, and it exists digitally if you're curious, but I, I'm a proponent of this physical binder, but it's all color coded for visual cueing in the classroom. And if you work with second language learners or students with any learning differences or whatever it might be, and I would say anybody having these visual cues so that I'm reducing barriers or friction so that you can engage, better engage with the class community, it's all good. So I would say this, I'd walk into class whatever, when I'm going over what it means to be on time in my class, first week of school. And I would, I do it this way. I'd say, okay, everybody, I'm Mr. Weathers. Welcome, blah, blah, blah. Here's what it means to be on time in my class. And I would walk out of the classroom. Not very long, because that's against Ed Cope, but I would just kind of like mess with them a little bit. And then I'd walk back in, I'd grab some kids binder, their organized binder, I would find an empty spot. I would sit down and I would open my binder to this white B tab and in there, they're called weekly lifelines and they're white. And I would just sit there. And then I would stand up and I'd hand that kid's binder back and I'd walk up to the front of the class and I'd say, okay, now turn to your neighbor and tell him what it means to be on time. And the whole class would erupt in conversation. And then of course we would, you know, pair, she'd like, tell me what you heard. And if, by doing so, everybody knew. I'm like, hey, look, that's all you have to do. Just get here on time. It's it, it's it's we it's what I've often said is um, there's there's a lot of gray areas in in a teachers and oftentimes in teachers lesson plans a lot of ambiguity, and that's where we lose kids, like those undefined spaces. Even if they're 30 seconds or 15 seconds, or and I'm not saying this is like an authoritarian thing, but we do our students a favor by painting the gray areas black and white. That's what I've always told my students too. Like, look, now you have a decision to make. I call them character questions. Are you gonna show up or not? Are you good? Like, if you know what's expected and it's fair and you can do it, then I've kind of left that up to you. And that's where some of this agency starts to come in. And if by, again, by virtue of that routine, I get practice with these different skills, um, it can be a win-win. So that's an excellent example. And I love that you're, you're naming too. I'm thinking about for multilingual learners who are relatively new to English, just being able to watch you do that, watch you come into the room, sit down, stagger the binder, flip to that page. Like that is already like a hurdle that we're overcoming. That could be a hurdle if we were using words initially. I mean, there's, there's so much there. That's just like universal design for learning. <laughs> that is yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> and the other thing I, I didn't mention for a classroom context, everything that a student has in their physical organized binder, this is why I actually exists digitally, I'm projecting in the classroom. So they're seeing it in their binder. If there were 40 kids in the room, which I hope there's not, there's 39 other versions and it's up there. So I'm constantly, and I always see it as reducing friction. Like what I'm trying to do if, if, let's talk about second language or multi-language learners for a moment. They tend to spend a significant amount of cognitive energy just navigating the school day or the class period, just trying to keep up. And if you've worked with those students and those populations, there's a certain fatigue on their face at the end of the school day um, that I don't think is the result of like, oh, I've just learned so much. Right. I don't think that's what's going on. It's just taxing. It's so taxing to everything I'm learning. In other words, everything I'm seeing and I'm hearing for the most part, I'm translating and I'm constantly just trying to keep up. And so if I can reduce friction or in other words, if I can have such a hyper predictable learning routine that you just know what to do to engage with the learning community then I'm liberating percentages of cognitive energy that once was spent on navigating. And what a win for the students, right? And they just feel better because it's safer. And it, I want students to walk to my learning space knowing exactly what to do to be successful. 
Now, here's the other thing. Um, when they do, it gives me an opportunity to acknowledge the successes. And I always call them victories because for many of the students that I've worked with historically, they don't have all that many successes or victories in an academic setting. And these victories, Lindsay, that we're talking about are not tied to content mastery. And most of the time in the modern classroom, success or victories are largely tied to content mastery such that if I'm struggling with the content, I may see myself as a learner as less a part of this learning community because I'm not as quote unquote smart or as gifted as some of these others. I could be wrong about that interpretation, but as soon as I start telling myself that, students tend to lean back rather than lean in. And I've seen this work over and over when students experience celebrated victory. So it's, I have to acknowledge it too. It's not just them figuring it out on their own. And so with the students I was first working with, when Organized Binder started to coalesce, like I could walk around and be like, way to go, you have your binder open to the B page, the weekly lifeline, or with like all these little things that had nothing to do with the lesson. You and I this whole time have yet to talk about any subject matter, any lesson, any context. And that's the whole point, right? This is a content agnostic tool, but when students, uh, experience those celebrated victories at a minimum, they just like being there because they're tired of failing. Who likes to fail all the time when they show up to something? But they can begin, there's a paradigm shift that can happen. I've seen it happen. Well, they'll, they'll start to lean in because we know when you're struggling, that's the time to lean in and try even harder. But sometimes we have to, we have to um, foster that. And this is, this is one way to do it. Absolutely. Okay. I love that. And I, and I also know you said this at the start too, but it helps teachers as well, right? If I am thinking about planning a unit's worth of lessons, let's say I have a two month unit. Okay. Now I'm facing down, you know, however many uh, units that would, or lessons that would be like 40 lessons. And I, I want to get creative and I want to engage students. And now I'm on teachers pay teachers paying money out of my own pocket to try to do all these creative activities when really, if we did five routines and repeated them throughout the entire two months, our students would have more cognitive ability to engage with the content that's changing every day. They would have more success. We would be able to better focus on what it is I need to teach every day. We'd have more energy for student relationships because we're not lesson planning into like, you know, three in the morning. I mean, there's so much that that is here that benefits both the students, I think, and the teachers that is so important, especially when we, we mentioned time at the start, like not mm. only do teachers feel like they not, don't have enough time for the content and fitting it all in, but just to be able to do all the tasks that teachers need to do in their planning time without taking work home is like, time is such a factor. This feels like a win-win for students and teachers. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. It's been, um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from in, in veteran teachers saying, oh my gosh, like on the backside of a training or something. This is all the stuff I've wanted or known I need to do for years. And I just have not found the time to do it. And here it is for me. You're gifting this to me. And it will actually save class time because you have a more predictable learning routine. So absolutely a win-win. And for new teachers out there, um, get a hold of us. It's like a, a godsend for just having that lesson structure. Um, we're not really going into a whole intro right now, but there's organized binder will frame a daily lesson plan, but it also captures a uh, teacher's unit sequencing, which is just as important. Um, and ultimately what a teacher a couple of weeks ago called the crown jewel uh, at the end of the school year or the semester, because we work with colleges as well, students walk with a curated portfolio of their learning from the first day of school to the last day. And I, I've started calling them trophies because talk about agency and pride, like just beaming. And we're not, and I keep saying this, we're not talking about content and we're not talking about grades. You could have a C minus 
and you have your crown jewel at the end of the school year that you've created, not me. This is your, your daily reflections, your daily plan. We're doing it together as a class community, but it's, it's, a, it's a profound experience, but it's all built from this predictable routine that you're noticing for teachers, what it can do to set them up for success as well. And I, I don't want you to give too much away, but I'm, I'm curious to know, I think as a listener, I'd heard about organized, organized binder before I actually met you. And I was like, oh, I want to like kind of picture what this looks like. And so I'm just wondering, could you, I know at the beginning when you were saying, okay, I come in, I flipped the white page and you specifically said, you know, it's a white page. It's under the V tab. It's, a, you know, like all of these things, like, what does the, can you describe a little bit what the binder looks like? What are the various pieces of a binder that frame like just that lesson level that you're talking about? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll do this verbally. And then everybody just go over to the website and you can see one and it'll all make sense. Um, so there's, a, we call it a student bundle and a teacher would get what's called a class set of 40, which is usually more than enough. But I also, it's another thing that bothers me about our educational system. When you, there's an initiative at a school and I get my class set and it's like got 32 of whatever it is. And there's 36 kids in my class. So we try to go super heavy because we're all rooted in, in the teacher's reality and experience. Um, and they would open up their bundle. And I'm going to add this in because we've talked about teachers. We've talked about students. And we also have to talk about families because family engagement is paramount for student success. And what every organized binder bundle comes with is a bilingual family guide or parent guide that goes home to basically explain the system and how it's used, um, but to offer kind of sets parents and, and families up to support learners as well, but with specific prompts to try to move it away from how was school today? What did you learn? Nothing. Do you have any homework? Like those conversations can very quickly devolve, but if I have specific prompts around the goals I've set in my daily task or my reflection, or even just knowing like, what'd you guys do today? Why well, I, I can look in your, your binder and it's all there, that kind of thing. So they would see that, but then the, uh, our binders, which are, I'm super proud of this. So I just got to put it in there. Um, it's one of the only, um, SFC certified green binders you'll find, um, Honestly, it's a, it's a pretty hard process to get your stuff certified. Um, so everything that we, we um, have in, uh, you know, our whole product line is all U.S. made and 100% recycled materials for the lowest carbon, uh, possible carbon footprint um, and no crappy vinyls or plastics that would end up in a landfill. Because why should we, you know, nurture the next generation and, and ruin the planet at the same time? And our industry is a bad actor when it comes to that. Anyway, so I'm proud of our product line. They open it up. There's eight tabs. If we're talking about K-12, this is a little bit different for college. Um, a, and the, it's very simple, all color coded, A through H. Um, and A, if you flipped the A tab, you would see a gold um, goal setting page. And so students get to... Uh, together as a class community, but very individually set um, goals. And we review and, and come back to them, like I was saying, um, each term or each quarter or every few weeks. Um, then there's a B tab, a C tab, and they're all, they're all color coded. I could go through the whole thing. Um, but again, it's all for visual cueing that I could just see where I need to be and flip to that tab. Does that answer your question? That is perfect. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. Like people can actually open this and look at it online, right? You have like these, these templates and they're, they're, I think the images are color coded as well, right? They show like this paper is going to be in this color. Yeah. 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 You can see it all. And if you want the, the best way to get that intro. Um, so for all you listeners out there, we can um, share with you or gift you um, a digital copy of our bilingual parent guide. Um, and give you access to some tutorials, not as so much a training, because I know you don't maybe even know what this whole thing is, but if you did want to check it out and like see it opened up and 
the working components, Lindsay, I think we should do those tutorials. That would be helpful. That sounds perfect. So those will be the freebies for this episode and I'll link those in the show notes and on the blog post. So that would be great. Um, cool. Thank you so much for, for kind of going through all of that. I know we just talked about a lot of different things and there are a yeah. lot of different pieces to this. And so if I am maybe like a teacher, my, my administrator hasn't, hasn't decided to go ahead and actually purchase organized binder, but like I'm starting to get ready to have that conversation with them, or I'm starting to like start small in my class and think about like, how do I kind of really wrap my head around prioritizing, um, these, these learning routines that are, what, what was the phrase that you used? Hyper predictable. I love that. Um, cool. and, and, you know, what would that one thing be that would get me started on that? If I could just take one step after this episode, what would you say that should be? Yeah. Good question. Good questions. Uh, in terms of the organized binder thing, I would, and always do encourage that. So in other words, the pilot, something small that uh, one teacher or a handful of teachers or maybe one class um, or something along those lines so that it's kind of um, running an experiment to see like, hey, is this, is this worthwhile? Is it, it, is it, is it gonna do everything that, that uh, this guy's saying kind of thing? But really to make it the, your own and the school zone and kind of kick the tire. So that that's the way I would go about it um, rather than like a school-wide rollout in the first year. I don't, I don't advocate for that. If you're a classroom teacher and the funding is not there um, or you think it's not there, and, and I would say contact me. Well, Mike, I'm sure you can get a hold of me here. We can have that conversation because you'd be pretty surprised about the funding and how we can make it work. But the 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 lens or the review of your own practice your own pedagogy is can you if you're interested in creating predictable learning spaces and that's true of a brick and mortar classroom or our, our last year and a half in distance learning or whatever that environment a predictable routine is is that it's not just a classroom thing is what i'm saying but let's just pretend we're talking to the classroom teacher start to review and reflect upon your expectations or your you know policies or procedures or whatever you call them and ask yourself if you can communicate them non-verbally like do do students know when when it's possible know your expectations without of course you have to communicate them once or twice but where you know where we typically see them I could ask you a question where, let me ask you, Lindsay, let's reverse roles. Where, if you were to walk into to a classroom, where most often do you see a list of expectations? I would say know? like a poster on the wall. Poster on the wall. And I can, I, it, the, there is research around this, that if we're not constantly kind of curating that which is on our walls in a classroom, and I forget the time frame, but it's surprisingly short that it literally becomes invisible, like students are not seeing it anymore. And we all do this, it's a good idea, but there's this poster up there and sometimes it's like five years old because you have really good expectations. I'm telling you, they're, if, if you're struggling with them um, engaging with those, it could be your communication modality. So trying to make them part of a routine and trying to make them when possible, communicated non-verbally, um, or at least working towards that can be really, really helpful. That's that's some of the underpinnings of Organized Binder. If you wanted to bring some of this into your classroom, go listen and watch all those tutorials. I'm basically gonna pull the veil back on our online training program for free for all of you. You don't, it's not embedded in a course, so you can just go watch the videos. Just go check them out and then see what you get from that. Um, but I can tell you all of it is built around the skills and habits that research has overwhelmingly indicated help students be successful. And again, it's content agnostic. So it doesn't matter what you teach. It doesn't matter what grade level you teach. These are universal. I love a good content agnostic tool. This is, this is the best. <laughs> And so as we move to close, I really appreciate all of just the value that you've provided for, for teachers and content in this, this episode and for leaders as well. Um, 
I'm just curious to know, I think everyone on the podcast is like a self-described lifelong learner. I know we're in a mastermind together, so we, you know, we continue yeah. to learn and grow, but what is something that you've been learning about lately? I've been learning that in, in our next newsletter, this is the, the title for it. I've really been struck by this. Um, don't try this alone is going to be what I'm our, our, our next newsletter. And um, what I mean by that is, in other words, teaching and school leadership, like don't try this alone, that the coaching and the support that's out there, um, I've been just learning a lot about really cool organizations and entities that are all around coaching or supporting, whether it be school leaders or teachers. And it's just really struck me lately. I've had some really interesting conversations um, and and also diving into some interesting literature around like getting dialed in on what what does it mean to su- to support and coach classroom teachers so that but that there's some data and metrics around that. It's not like kumbaya, not that that's a bad thing, but um, so that's that's one thing that has that has really struck me lately. Like this is, we can't, you can't do this alone. Um, and maybe that's why our, our attrition rates are so high, you know, in the first three to five years in our industry. And so often like new teachers in certain environments can just be going at it alone and it's hard. It's hard. So, um, yeah, in terms of education space, that's something I've been learning. That's awesome. And so powerful. Yes. Because I was ready to quit after the first three years of my teaching career. And like, I I love teaching. I think I was actually like a decent teacher, you know, once I got a handle on things, but it took those three years of figuring it out with minimal support. And so if that support exists, which it totally does, like it is well worth whatever time or monetary investment that you need to make to get it and just feel better the rest of your career. So and and you'd be hard pressed in other careers to that's part of it, right? Like the ongoing support and training and, and, and yet with teachers, like right now I'm supporting a brand new teacher. I think I've shared this with you. Um, she's a second career coming out of um, second career teacher coming out of a very successful career as an executive media executive. And her last job was with MGM and like, she's she's transitioned into the classroom and she has a heart for migrant and immigrant students and she got a job teaching digital media as a cte teacher middle school and it's i mean she's working with a a very marginalized population and with that comes specific challenges um and i've now we meet every week and we just talk she's using organized binder and we're we're doing that and I asked her this last week. I'm like, so it's kind of cliched. Everybody says how hard teaching is. I'm like, just compare them for me. Like, is teaching harder than what you've done before? And she was just like, she about fell out of her chair. She And she's only teaching three classes. And what she's recognizing is not only just the workload and figuring out how do you, how do you teach? Like, how, like, that's just, how do I teach all this stuff, right? The emotional the relational, um, what's the right word or expression for it? Like what we've spent a lot, I'll just tell you, we've spent a lot of time not talking about her content or in that, like the positive meditation, like where do I put my gaze? Because if I have 30 kids in a room and these four are giving me some static every day, our tendency is to just focus on that. And I keep trying to tell her like, but there's 26 other students in the room and you're not, not that you're not seeing them. It's that when you go home at night and you go home on the weekends, I can promise you it's, you're just focused on those four. And it's like the emotional, you know, weight of that. Like there's th- things about teaching that are taxing that no one can see or, or, or they don't talk about in graduate school and all of that. So that, that's the, don't go at it alone. You got to have somebody to, to support you and, and talk to you. That is perfect. And finally, last question, where can listeners learn more about you or organize Binder or connect online? Yeah, well, you know how active I am on social media. I'm kidding, everybody. Um, 
Best way would be just go to our website, organizedbinder.com. Um, and if you, easiest way, so you don't have to forget, just go to the contact link. And if you want to chat with me, that, that won't go to my inbox. But if you say, hey, I want to, I heard Mitch on Lindsay's show, I want to chat. Um, I am, I would love to speak with you via phone, meet up on a Zoom. I love doing that. So that's probably be the easiest way. But yes, you can find uh, our organized binder handle on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of those places. But uh, warning, we don't post too often. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing Mitch and thank you so much for being on the podcast this was wonderful thanks for having me this is super fun thanks for listening amazing educators if you loved this episode you can share it on social media and tag me at Lindsay Beth Alliance or leave a review of the show so leaders like you will be more likely to find it to continue the conversation you can head over to our time for teachership Facebook group and join our community of educational visionaries until next time leaders continue to think big act brave and be your best self Thank you.